Dave, it's great to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Great to be with you, Sarah. When I think of AI and machine learning, which is part of the title of this discussion, I don't necessarily think of a 115-year-old cereal company. Tell me why I'm wrong. What are you doing in this area that's so exciting? There's a lot of exciting things. You know, we've jumped into the future and I can understand how you'd have that perspective. But let me give you some examples. If you start with our supply chain, so much of the way we run our supply chain has not really changed. It's about having the right ingredients in the right place at the right time in the right quantities. But you think about the number of variables that go into decisions like that and how important it is so that we can make quality food on time in full for our customers with limited waste. Now, all those variables in the past were made by people with lots of things changing as they made those decisions. The advent of artificial intelligence, the ability to take all of that data and then react to sudden surprises or disruptions in the system, allow us to be so much more efficient and effective in making sure that we make product in the right way at the right time with the least amount of waste. And that's only one example. There's multiple examples on different parts of our business on where this applies. Would love to hear about it, but just on the supply chain point, is that how you got through the pandemic, because there were fears of food shortages and there, and there was a little bit we saw of shortages in terms of on the shelves and retailers getting the right amount of product. But for the most part, America's food supply chain held up and, and we were fed in credit there, to you and, and some of your, your peers. Is, is that because of the supply chain learnings that well, you're describing? Yeah, thanks for that. And in large part, it had a lot to do with it, because as I said, one of the things that artificial intelligence and the ability to manage this data in the midst of disruption. Um, it allowed us to be so much more agile in moving things around and making sure that we could meet this elevated demand that really came out of nowhere. And so, you know, it's impossible to say if this had happened 10 years ago, would we have had the same capability? But I, I think not. I think that most of the capabilities that we just uh, talked about had a lot to do with our ability to meet that unprecedented demand. You talked about using big data for supply, but also for the consumer. How, how do you get the best data? There's so many sources, social media, to get insights. What are you using right now that points you to where the consumer's going? Uh, well, as you said, it's coming from all different places. So we have primary data. We have something called Kellogg Family Rewards where we have a relationship one-to-one -one with our consumers. We have uh, data from our retailers at the point of purchase. We have the social media uh, aspect of it. We also have a direct-to-consumer uh, relationship. So it comes in so many different formats and in, in magnitudes that we've never seen before. And so you know, having the data is obviously a rich treasure trove, but the ability to mine the data and what we do with it and how we really understand how to make connections with consumers is really the holy grail. Because you know, you've heard me say in the past that consumers will tell you one thing, and it's not that they're being dishonest, but people aspire to certain things and they'll say, yeah, this is what I'd like to do or this is what I do. The way they actually behave is it's always different. somewhat different. So being able to really understand that data and understand what motivates consumers to make purchases, to stay loyal, you know, is really very valuable. And we're, again, in, the, in a future state where just a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have imagined, you know, where we are today. We're also a bit of an added bit of an inflection point when it comes to what the consumer wants and how, how they want it. I would imagine you and, and so many other food companies have seen sales soar as a result of the pandemic. We're eating at home again. We're eating breakfast at home again and cereal at home again. Clearly, that's been a boon for your business, but the question is what comes next? What are you telling people? Yeah, so, you know, I've called the pandemic as terrible as it is, obviously, an opportunity for a company like ours. First, it started with the responsibility, keeping people fed, you know, meeting our obligations to our customers and making sure that our people were operating in the safest possible way to provide food that people, you know, people really wanted, food that they trusted. But it also provided us with the greatest sampling opportunity of all time, the greatest reappraisal opportunity of all time. People rediscovered, as you said, the joy of cereal, the convenience of cereal, the economic nature of cereal, but also our snacks like Pringles and Cheez-It. You know, people, you know, rediscovered those, discovered them for the first time. Pop-Tarts, you know, 
absolutely went through the roof. And so all Eggos this was an opportunity. In my house. Excellent. You know, egg, blueberry mm-hmm. ego in my house is big time as well. But now it's, as you said, what do we do with it? And so we've had this great opportunity. And what we want to do is make that stick. And so we want to make sure that when people come out of the pandemic and they stop doing things that they didn't want to do in the first place, but that we're part of the consideration set where they rediscovered things or discovered things um, for the first time or rediscovered them, they keep doing. And so the relationship we have with our consumers and the type of messaging we're having with our consumers is all about making sure that we get that stickiness and that we continue to earn their loyalty day in and day out so that as they have more freedom and are on the go again, that we remain part of that consideration set and part of that, you know, part of their pantry and part of that on the go occasion as well as the new normal slowly unfolds. How do you do that? How do you make sure they don't just go back to breakfast sandwiches and yogurt cups? Well, it starts with making sure that we provide the most excellent experience from, you know, beginning to end. And so from beginning is making sure we meet them where they want to be met. And in, again, the pandemic, we saw our e-commerce business, you know, double in size. So the ability through our retail partners and others to deliver food straight to their door, if that's what they want, to make sure it's in stock if they're still walking into a brick and mortar store, but making sure we're available in the way that they want us to be available. And that when they you know, take our product home or on the go and they consume it, that they have the most delightful experience imaginable. And that is making quality food day in and day out, but it's also bringing new innovative ideas, new innovative packaging solutions, you know, new innovative uh, messaging that really resonates with them so that you know, the connection that they made with our brands stays strong. And again, they, they, you know, they keep with us despite the changing nature of the pandemic as they become more mobile, as they go back to work, whatever the case may be, that the ability that we had to make those connections last going forward because we delight them from the moment they purchase to the moment that they consume. You said your e-commerce business doubled during the pandemic, obviously a huge acceleration there. How have you pivoted to address that and, and does that continue? Yeah, so in, in ways we were fortunate because we had been making a lot of investments in e-commerce and e-commerce capability prior to the pandemic because we saw what everybody saw. I mean, this is the way the world is moving, but it was moving at a certain pace. And what we saw was that pace, as I said, it doubled and it continues to grow at very, very high rates. And so the capabilities were already being built. We just had to accelerate them. And so it's making sure that, again, we can meet them at, the, in this case, the digital shelf. And that you know when they come shopping and looking for us, that we're there for them in the way you know, that they expect and that we make those connections and that we have the data and we have the understanding of exactly you know, what is a satisfactory experience, what is not a satisfactory experience, and we continue to build on you know, what works for them. Feels very fragmented, the whole world of online grocery delivery. And these big companies have been trying to figure it out. Obviously, the pandemic, everyone had to figure it out. But there's Amazon, there's Kroger. I'm thinking about the U.S. market globally, even more options. How do you think it shakes out? Is it going to be just a a few key large grocery stores? Or are people just going to be going to their individual independent retailer? How, How do you figure something like that out? It's a great question. And it's, you know, it's one of those unknowable things. But from a prediction standpoint, I think it's going to remain very crowded and very competitive. And what we saw is a number of the retailers that you mentioned, as well as Pure Plays and, uh, you know, new entrants, were all very successful. And it's, you know, there's a different, there's different ways in which the consumers want to get their food, as I said, some want to let, you know, direct to their um, doorstep. Others want to go and collect it themselves, through click and collect ventures. And the other thing that I'd say is, you know, not lost in this is think about during a pandemic, how well brick and mortar retailers did with their omni-channel approach. So click and collect and direct delivery, but also in their stores. So many people, despite a pandemic, kept going into their grocery stores so that they could have that experience in store. And so what it points to is that consumers want a a variety of different things. And so there's gonna be a lot of room for a lot of different players, but it's about execution 
and it's about keeping the consumer at the heart and soul of everything that they do. So I don't see a great shakeout coming, but what I see is a lot of continued innovation, a lot of pressure on making sure you understand the consumer and that you meet the consumer the way that they want to be met. Because the one thing I will tell you that's happened during this pandemic is consumer expectations went up. They didn't go down. And so people have realized that convenience comes in many different ways. And the online is, is one great example. You know, at doubling, there is so many people that had no idea that they could have their groceries delivered to their door. And some of them, you know, experienced it and said, you know, this, this works for me, but I, I like brick and mortar better. I can't wait to get back into the store. And others said, I can't believe the convenience of this and I will never go back. And so innovation is going to be key and omni-channel and having a variety of different approaches to meet those different consumers in those different need states is going to be paramount. Are there any retailers that you would call out as doing a better job when it comes to serving that con consumer that is increasingly demanding convenience? Yeah, so you know, I try and stay away from talking about specific retail customers, uh, but there, there is a number of them. And what I can tell you is you know, some uh, prognosticators in years past have, you know, and I mentioned this, have called for, you know, the death knell of the brick and mortar. It's destined for the dustbin of history. And we saw is that's just not the case. And so, you know, those that execute, those that innovate, those that keep the consumer at the heart and soul of everything that they do, there's room. And it's going to be a fascinating time. It's been a fascinating time. But I think the next several years, if you think about being in consumer goods and being in retail, um, you know, it is an exciting place. It is not, it is, it is not your father's, you know, Oldsmobile. It's, it's a very exciting, innovative, high tech type of place to be. What about food trends themselves, Steve? What, what, what are your insights and your data telling you about what the consumer wants? Before the pandemic, it was, it was healthy uh, and it was real ingredients. And a lot of the CPG companies like yours were pivoting to meet the consumer there or buying smaller brands that were doing a better job. What is it yeah, now? So th that trend continues. And in some ways, the pandemic did a lot to accelerate people's understanding of health and wellness and appreciation for the importance of it, right? And nothing like a pandemic to make people realize I need to be as healthy as I possibly can be to meet this extraneous th threat. And so what you've seen is a growing awareness of health and wellness and a continued acceleration of innovation and interest in that space. And that will continue. But what we've also seen is this continued bifurcation. And so it gets back to what I said before, what people tell you they want to do and what they do are oftentimes different. So people talk a lot about health and wellness and indeed it is a real trend, but they also love to snack and they love indulgence. And so we've seen a continued uh, interest in, you know, tasty treat making and indulgent um, types of uh, categories. And we've got a big snack business, as I said, our, our Pringles business, our Cheez-It business, our Rice Krispies treats business have all done extremely well pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. And our health and wellness brands, you know, our Morningstar Farms, our frozen business, our new Incognito launch, um, continue to accelerate based on the type of mega trends around health and wellness, convenience, and so forth. So the big ones are health and wellness, as you mentioned, uh, treat making and indulgence and convenience. And, you know, you hear people talking about the frozen business and that's become, you know, the new kind of convenient factor. But one thing that underlies all this is the importance of transparency, you mentioned clean labels. So really understanding the ingredients that are in my food, the purity of those ingredients, the simplicity of those ingredients, even when it's in the snack uh, category continues to be something that's very important to consumers. Do you think we're gonna continue to see a lot of M&A in this space where bigger, more established brands like yours are gonna go after some of the smaller, faster growing, I mean, some of those brands were growing like a hockey stick before the pandemic and they were getting scooped up for very high valuations because that's where the consumer was. I suspect you're going to see that. And there's nothing like you know, a crisis like this to dislocate a lot of different things. And what you saw pre-pandemic is, as you mentioned, a lot of these fast growing, innovative disruptors being bought by you know companies like ours. Many of those companies have struggled in the pandemic because they didn't have the same kind of stability of supply chain they didn't have the same loyalty built in with their consumers. And so 
a lot have struggled. And so I think what you'll see is some of those struggling businesses being picked up. Um, I think some of them you know, won't be picked up and will continue to struggle. But the other element to this is we've seen organic opportunities in our business, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. Now, we were growing pre-pandemic. You know, we had turned the business back to growth, which we were very proud of, and the pandemic only accelerated that. And so when we look at our resource allocation and where we want to put the next dollar, you know, we, we measure, you know, inorganic opportunities, what we could acquire versus what's already inside our portfolio. And when you have brands like, you know, I mentioned Ego growing at double digit, we're selling every box that we can make. When you look at our snack business, which is growing dramatically, dramatically, you look at our emerging markets businesses, which are doing extremely well, we'll have to look at any acquisition opportunity as compared to the organic opportunities that we have in front of us, which are very compelling. Finally, as you look out over the next few years, Steve, what what macro trends do you see for the consumer? You mentioned health and wellness, online spending, obviously that, that's top of mind. What, what other trends or predictions do you see that you're trying to think ahead and trying to position the company for the future of, and not just in the immediate term of getting out of this pandemic and getting people to eat breakfast at home or cereal on the go? I think there's a couple of things, you know, convenience, as I already mentioned, is absolutely critical because people have been, again, taught that they can be, have their needs met in so many different innovative ways. And so the demand for convenience and versatility is going to be very important. Health and wellness, we mentioned, I think that's going to continue to grow in importance and customization. You know, people understanding their own health and wellness, but also their own needs and desires. And how are you going to make it for me? How do I know that what you're doing as a company means something for me, not only the food you make and how it relates to what my dietary needs are, but also you as a company, are you living the types of values that I want to be associated with? So the whole notion of ESG and the growing importance of that is going to become increasingly important to consumers and is indeed. And I think that's that's just going to continue. So I want a company that I can trust, that's transparent, that makes food for me, but also represents the values that I want to be associated with. Communicating with your customer is also key. Just curious, you're, you're a big advertiser, as a lot of these big food, beverage, and household products companies are. How are you thinking about shifting ad dollars in this environment, and going to digital like everyone else? And, and within that, where does social media fit in? Yeah, so it's a great question. We are digital first, um, and I wouldn't have been able to say that a couple of years ago. Historically, you would make a classic 30-second television commercial. You take components of that and make it into your digital space, and now it's all about digital first, social media being a big part of that. And one of the great things about that is we see real-time results and feedback from our consumers in the digital and social media space in ways that we wouldn't have dreamed of about a couple of years ago. So our ability to manage our return on investment and make connections with the consumers in this digital first space, is very exciting. Is there anywhere on the, where you, where social media platform where you're getting the most bang for your buck right now? It's, you know, it continues to evolve and it continues to be geographic dependent as well as cohort dependent. So it depends on, you know, who you're targeting. So if we're targeting, you know, a special K consumer versus an RX bar consumer versus a Pringles consumer, it's going to differ because those audiences gravitate to different social media environments, different channels, different, um, you know, aspects of that. And so, you know, we tend to make it brand specific, cohort specific, but there's a lot of exciting spaces to be sure. Who is your core demographic right now? Again, it, it depends on which brand you're talking about. And with a, with a company like ours, what's very exciting is our consumer is really the entire globe. In this country, it's virtually everybody. We have household penetration that's well above 90% because again, we sell cereal, we sell snacks, we sell frozen food. We represent virtually every occasion. And so the cohort and the target consumer will vary very much depending on which brand we're talking about. But we, you know, we love all our consumers and we have the great fortune of representing just about everybody out there. Spoken like a, a true consumer CEO. Yeah, well, you do have an, an 18 month old in my household on Egos. So start, start them early. Thank you so much, Steve. It was, it was great to talk to you and hear your thoughts. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Great being with you. And with that, I'll send it back to you guys in Toronto.